thank you, Father, for a kind introduction and for invitation. And um, like other speakers during this conference, the purpose of my presentation is to show the development of Thomism in a particular area. In my case, it's uh, about so-called biblical Thomism. And uh, it might seem that the word biblical placed next to the word Thomism will signify an escape to the biblical view of the world, thus validating the charge leveled by Whitehead uh, nearly 100 years ago when he diagnosed that the problem with theology was its persistent attachment to the old world view. Classical theology, he maintained, was losing its ability to understand the surrounding world, its categories no longer matching the phenomena they were attempting to describe, with the inevitable consequence being that theology would become relegated to the backwater of thought. According to that view, while science follows new categories, theology remains stuck in the old language. This entails a risk similar to that when a user fails to update a modern electronic device. If, for example, a mobile phone is not updated for a long time, it will eventually become impossible to send or receive messages. Whitehead's proposition was revolutionary. Leave behind the old, the classic metaphysics of substance, all biblical categories, and embrace the new, the philosophy of becoming. In the same situation, however, St. Thomas would have responded differently. Embrace both the old and the new, since the new doesn't develop by abandoning the old, just as the New Testament is not an ex nihilo creation that ignores the revelation of the old covenant, but by reading the Old Testament in ever more depth, I perfectly illustrated by Thomas' commentary on Hebrews. This resembles the situation of the householder uh, mentioned in the gospel who brings both old and new things from his treasury. Importantly, when St. Thomas explains this short parable from Jesus in his commentary, the Matthew uh, gospel, St. Thomas interprets this image as the relationship between the Old and the New Testament. Thus, theology doesn't advance by abandoning and severing itself from the Old or by inventing new constructs. Instead, it delves deeper into pre-existing knowledge in the spirit of hermeneutic of continuity. This is the founding principle, I think, of biblical Thomism. The language of theology should not discard the biblical vocabulary in favor of a modern one, but should instead foster the relationship with the source and update it within a new context. Hence, biblical Thomism is an art of integration that can be applied to all theology rather than a mere aspect of the systematization of Aquinas' thought. It's quite evident that a biblical Thomas began to establish itself as a way to regain first the old, that is, the biblical commentaries, which had been coming out of obscurity over the years, and then the tradition of church fathers as the source of Aquinas' thinking, although taking into account what had been taking place after Thomas among his commentators. The revived interest in St. Thomas' exegesis from Speak, Father Chenny, has led in the first place to the realization that there is a biblical trait in his theology, a combination of speculative reasoning and interpretation of revelation. This is not about extracting further assertion from the biblical text, but about combining what has been revealed with systematic reflection. Successive publications have pointed to historical issues concerning not only the authorship of the commentaries, but also St. Thomas' sources from the very text of the Bible that he used in his work, here the great contribution is of Father Bataillon, to his uh, deference to church fathers, like in the case of Professor Elders, to the philosophical citation appearing in the commentaries. The impulse that contributed to the recognition of something more than a renaissance of commentaries 
was the research conducted by Father Pinkers, recalling the biblical language that St. Thomas had either abandoned it nor treated as a burden. These new trends in approaching the biblical heritage are exemplified by Father Torell, who has pointed out that biblical commentaries accounted for the majority of Aquinas' academic, war, academic time and are now essential in order to understand his systematic works. The years that follow have brought more in-depth analysis of the presence of scripture in Aquinas' theological work, as well as of his procedures and their importance to the understanding of the roots of certain theological assertion, as it was expressed in the important book of Valkenberg, Words of the Living God. In that bind, one can also approach Matthew Levering's seminal publication, Scripture and Metaphysics, which addresses uh, Aquinas' theological method and demonstrates that the Thomistic expression ad scripturam, ad fontes, is about more than the text alone. As it has turned out, this is a confrontation of a style of theology that doesn't seek refuge in biblicism or treat scripture as a loose collection of inspiration, taking note of how Thomas explains scripture has the effect of revealing the participative importance of history and theology. My presentation is divided into three parts. In the first part, I will explain the essence of the Biblical Thomas project. Next, I will discuss the general lines along which Biblical Thomas has been developing in recent times, providing a, a map, as it were, of this school of thought. Finally, I will present an example of proposed approach to the thematic analysis that stems from Biblical Thomism and outline the emerging prospects for further research. By analogy to music, employing a new method can always be compared to taking a new key that changes what one has previously been listening to. This is not a matter of altering the entire piece, the lyrics or the score. Instead, it's a matter of reading it in a different way than before and beginning to understand the interrelationships, implications and dependencies. The result is a work in which there is no need to isolate individual bars or treat them as independent parts. Instead, the focus is on discovering the mutual relationships. Biblical Thomism proposes a certain key that improves the clarity of the very theological project in which its exegesis plays an exemplifying role. The unique nature of this approach can be explained in several points, the key being the fourfold integration, doctrinal, theological, historical, and heuristic. So let's start with the first, doctrinal integration. Aquinas' biblical commentaries demonstrate a departure from monastic exegesis, which was based on the Lectio Divina and focused on moral sense, mainly, towards scientific exegesis that draws on Aristotle when it comes to explaining, for instance, the grace which requires understanding it as a motus or its necessitas, or when it comes to explaining the necessity of Christ's cross for the salvation of man. There is no shortage of reference to the fathers who are often quoted not only from the glossa, but also directly from the works that Thomas commissioned to be translated and happily included in his writing such as the manuscripts of the father commentaries brought to him by Albert the Great. In fact, as noted by Enrique Alarcón, Thomas' work typically involved borrowing through the ar archive of monasteries he visited. Thomas juxtaposes uh, the fathers with one another, notices uh, their different approach and attempts to understand them, as in the case of the Antiochian dispute as to whether St. Peter conducts there was a venial seal or mortal seal. In addition, there is the inclusion of dogmatic decrees of the councils, passages from the creed and philosophical reflections that require a rational approach. In short, a characteristic feature of Thomas' work is that he integrates the tradition with the speculative approach 
instead of choosing one against the other. The aim of that endeavor is scripturistic contemplation, acceptance of revelation, and participation in the sense knowledge of God. This means that the emphasis in biblical Thomism is methodological. It's an objection to separation of theology from the Bible, and at the same time, to the reduction of theology to a mere repetition of biblical quotations. The origins of Sacra Doctrina lie in the acceptance and systematic structure understanding of Revelation. The second integration, theological, uh, for, the, for this reason, uh, the presence of a biblical text in the Summa Theologiae is not surprising, for they are included not only at the beginning of Sacra Doctrina as a source, but also throughout it, from Lectio to Disputatio to Predicatio. In fact, the last of these elements seems to demonstrate that the goal here is also exitus reditus, coming from and returning to scripture. This is not simply springboard for exercises in speculative theology, but an extended system of roots that produces fruit in the form of theological assertion. This means discerning in the biblical quotation their multiple roles, confirmative when they offer a proof of interpretation proposed by Aquinas, explicative when they clarify the meaning of the text being commented upon, opening when they open new theological questions and deepening the, the meaning. Biblical quotations also appear in the set contra as a part of minor questions introduced in the commentaries. Here, they are used to address apparent contradiction between quotations from the biblical text or from the fathers, or to explain historical as well as moral or doctrinal discrepancies. In addition, they are frequently given in the end of the Lectio, where they provide verbal concordance, making it clear that the reference is being made to the same word, although occurring in different contexts, or are linked by concurrent theological ideas. Biblical Thomism reveals the biblical background of speculative theology at the level not only of scriptural references, but also of theological concepts taken from the Bible. This fundamental biblicality is not negated by the presence of philosophical terms. In addition to the universalist dimension, which the biblical message gains by referencing metaphysical concepts, and to the academic nature of his uh, exegesis, there is also a warning against the conceptual idolatry of the biblical language, which is why metaphysics is needed when reading the Bible. In consequence, biblical Thomism doesn't perceive metaphysics in exegesis as a foreign body that disturbs the pure water of scripture. The presence of philosophy, I mean in the form of quotation from Aristotle in biblical commentaries, the terminology used, the philosophical problems mentioned, serves to demonstrate that the biblical message is open to everyone. And perhaps in contrast to Peter Abelard's project in which science was the starting point, having in mind that the notion of science is of course the modern one, but uh, in case of Aquinas theology, has its starting point in the Bible and in the confrontation with science stemmed from the fact that the supernatural true can be known in its effect. In consequence, theology doesn't consist in exegesis alone, but in the integration of exegesis with speculative theology. It's not surprising, therefore, that uh, St. Thomas searches for a propositum in the commentaries, a doctrinal understanding of the text. For him, theology is biblical, uh, and the theological task is to express the biblical truth in a scientifically significant manner so as to demonstrate its intelligibility. Thus, Sacra Doctrina is a meeting point for the Bible and science. The third uh, integration is historical, and the integration that characterized biblical Thomas includes recognizing the role of the church fathers in Aquinas' exegesis. 
despite the conviction that a, a jump to the first century is necessary, as suggested by Karl Barth, in order to gain access to revelation, it being thus understood quasi-deistically, St. Thomas accepts the auctoritas of the fathers as partakers in the transmission of the tradition, taking their views into consideration and entering into a dialogue with them, Thomas incorporates them into the authority of the church by pointing to the ecclesial context of biblical exegesis as the correct hermeneutical horizon. Drawing from the text of the fathers is a manifestation of certain theological continuity to which Aquinas will remain faithful until the end and works such as the Catena Aurea are yet to be fully discovered and even more importantly, understood in depth so as to reveal how Thomas worked with this text and for what purpose. Thomas doesn't consider the Church Fathers to be a separate source in relation to scripture. Instead, he believes that their works make possible a correct understanding of the biblical text. This stems from the presence of the same spirit who fills the iographers and the Fathers, acting upon both intellect and will, although the inspiration is obviously different in two cases. Biblical Thomism, uh, the, the next integration, recuperates Thomas' theology of biblical senses, a concept which theologians uh, have become to grasp more truly in recent years. The primacy of the literal sense emphasized by Aquinas, inherited from Victorines, doesn't mean eliminating other senses or simply preferring one manner of interpretation. Instead, it means applying a more methodological procedure, which is something that came to the foreground in the famous dispute between uh, Henri de Libac and Barry Smalley. Biblical Thomism seeks to demonstrate that the literal sense is a starting point upon which the spiritual sense can subsequently be developed. Thus, a theologian is not faced with two parallel paths between which he or she can choose by following either the literal sense or the spiritual sense. In other words, the former is not a goal in itself, but a step on the way to the latter. The difference in importance between the two senses in exegesis reflects the fact that the literal sense play an argumentative role in theology but that doesn't diminish the value of spiritual sense. A spiritual interpretation of the New Testament is its literal sense. This procedure can be exemplified by the manner in which the words of one of the Psalms are interpreted. The Psalm 33, Congregant Sicunt in Utre Aquas Maris. And Aquinas explains them in a literal sense as a reference to the order of the world in which water doesn't flow out, but is contained. It's drawn for use and doesn't vanish. In biblical language, it's the prerogative of the God, the creator, to contain the sea. In that context, Aquinas derives etymology of the word abyssus from a basis, meaning without foundation. In the spiritual sense, he demonstrates that uh, the utre may, on the other hand, represent good men. Peoples come together in the church, as in the wineskin, a container made for the skin of death animal, and thus mortify themselves. Another interpretation points to converted sinners who have previously lived in the abyss of vices, like Paul, Matthew. The depths or abysses can also be interpreted as biblical senses that are deposited in the storehouse of the sacred scripture. Now, uh, the trends in the development of biblical tombs. When attempting to draw a map of biblical Thomism, it's worth noting that the development of this school of thought has been driven, so to speak, by three main objectives. First, to gain even greater knowledge of the textual content, chronology, and theological value of biblical commentaries, as well as specific biblical quotation that appear in different contexts. Secondly, to identify the purpose of this theological practice, which is to gain sapiential knowledge capable of interpreting reality in the light of the most fundamental reasons. Thirdly, 
to practice a method of analyzing theological subjects which are based on exemplaristic paradigm. Without doubt, biblical Thomas can be credited with restoring the value of biblical commentaries, which had for centuries been overshadowed by his systematic works. While their existence had not been completely forgotten, the value of scripture to the idea of theology itself had clearly been disregarded. What I'm referring to here is not a simple commentary on the biblical text that would constitute a goal in itself, but rather the beginning of theological journey. The Lectio was biblical and through the Disputatio in endeavor to bring everything together in the Predicatio. In uh, Thomas' work, the biblical text is in the center with everything else gravitating around it. Doctrinal synthesis fit upon references to scriptural texts and respects their guidance. This demonstrates that Thomas possesses a scripturistic imagination, we can see. In view of all these points, one might ask whether the Summa Theologiae was written for the commentaries or vice versa. While there certainly is some feedback, it's also clear that some of Aquinas' work, such as the Summa, cannot be taken in isolation from the Bible, that to treat them as self-contained pieces without any biblical references would be inexplicable from the standpoint of Aquinas' concept of sacra doctrina. It's important to consider the manner in which uh, biblical texts appear in other commentaries, such as concerning the works, for instance, of Pseudo-Dionysius, Boetius, or Aristotle in which the classic expression consonat scriptura appears, as in the case when uh, Aristotle, the anima, is juxtaposed with the biblical account of the soul and its ability to know the truth. Biblical Thomism helps highlight the sapiential character of theology, which is a wisdom-oriented knowledge that enables one to partake in contemplation. Being wise means being able to interpret the word in the light of the most fundamental reasons. This aspect is particularly evident in the Predicatio, which typically contains a question about the purpose, about why something is undertaken. Here, the answer that follows is attempt to combine many possible interpretations and thus arrive at the most appropriate convenience one. The goal of biblical Thomism is to encourage contemplation of the truth that is attested to in a biblical text and to draw attention to the purpose for which the Bible was written in the first place. This question is particularly relevant in time of the hermeneutical folk, which has emerged with historical critical exegesis and can be dispersed by reclaiming the above purpose. What matters in this form of contemplation in grasping the truth are the interpretation of the Church Fathers, linguistic analysis, and hermeneutics, built, for example, upon the division of the text, divisio major et minor, which such a reading of scripture, faith is the starting point, and the deepening and development of that faith is one of the goals. The key issue, however, is to orient the exegesis toward the truth, rather than towards emotional strengthening. Terms that uh, combine doctrinal uh, speculative matters and Christian life, for instance, the new creation, are important uh, for the, um, an important part of biblical Thomas. On the one hand, this gives rise to a number of issues concerning eschatology and the importance of the old creation in relation to the new creation. That is whether such creation will occur ex vetere or ex nihilo, or whether or not something will survive and pass on to eternity. In fact, St. Thomas relates Jesus' remark that the hairs of our heads are all number, in his commentary on Matthew, to the very question of the relationship between world lines and eternity. This uh, is why his exegesis points toward important truths of the faith, leaving the reader to relate them to his or her own life. What emerged from this method of working with the biblical text is a unique kind of Thomism, not a copy and paste Thomism of ready-made answers, but a Thomism that patiently builds the context, establishes a sense of direction, and constantly shows everyone where they are, 
thus addressing the meaning of human life within a broader sense and vision. The application of uh, this biblical Thomist procedure can be demonstrated as well by analysis of, for instance, God's rest, Kies Dei, after creation, I describe in the book of Genesis 2.2. Thomas discusses it in the context of his reflection on bodies at rest in the physical world and then relates it to the quiet life of Christians, as mentioned in the first letter to Thessalonians 4.11. The Latin word quies invokes in the first place the lack of motion, privatio motus, that is cessation of activity and attainment of the stable existence in a given place. However, there is also the rest of desire, he is desideri, that comes with the achievement of and repose in the desire end. And desire end. In this sense, Aquinas says that the will delights in the sought end, which is delectatio, and contemplation leads to the rest in truth, which is what a rest of conscience would consist in. But it's the earthy experience of such fulfillment that acts as the inception, in coatio, of an eternal rest in God. God's productive rest is so a model for human action. As Thomas notes in his commentary on Hebrews, I quote, just as in the old law, the Sabbath represented God's rest from his work, so too that rest will be that of the saints from their labors. Revelation uh, 14. From henceforth now says the spirit that they may rest from their labors. So this is not a case of inactivity since the redeemed are indeed active in beatific vision. A call to life quietly but not idly appears in the first Thessalonians letter Ut quieti cities. This refers to living a quiet life that is free from curiosity, as suggested by the quotation from the book of Proverbs 7:11, but also to protecting Christians from restlessness in quietudo. For the latter causes a great deal of damage by focusing a person's attention on secondary things, a consequence of the loss of original justice. This return to quies comes largely from continentia, which restrains one's behavior and introduces order into the sphere of sensual impulses. The journey from discovery of the meaning of rest in, in the world of material beings to the rest of desire and contemplation of sentient beings to God's rest after creation has its important liturgical dimension associated with the worship of God and the meaning of Sunday. For biblical Thomism, this liturgical aspect and the search for it, as undertaken by Aquinas himself, are equally important. The procedure is, in essence, an attempt to apply the integrating method of Sacra Doctrina to theological matters and demonstrates how dogma determines moral conduct. Conclusions. Since uh, St. Thomas describes even the effects of grace in terms of motion, one could ask about the direction in which biblical Thomism is moving. Coming from the hometown of Copernicus, the scholar who moved the earth and stopped the sun, as you can see in the monuments uh, in Torun, written in Latin, of course, uh, um, biblical Thomas, I believe, strives to move the Thomistic view so that, rather than looking at Thomas himself, we should look at what he observed and contemplated, the scripture that bears witness to revelation. What kind of tom of theology does biblical Thomas build, we can ask? The answer is uh, integrated, but not integristic. It's a theological culture that relies on arguments, abandoning the deistic understanding of revelation that reduces it to the past events. The later approach, similar to ignoring scripture in theology altogether, only uses scriptural texts sparingly as a mere confirmation of certain theses, 
or adds them as embellishment rather than a pivot of thought, which doesn't foster the cultivation of sacra doctrina. Biblical Thomism is fruitful in part because it can be in dialogue with other theological approaches grounded in scripture, including with contemporary theology that is biblically rich. For instance, some instances of resourcement theology, such as Ratzinger's or Balthazarian's. With Christian and Jewish biblical theologies and with the insights of historical, critical biblical scholarship, insofar as those insights interface with dogmatic theology. Biblical Thomism is Thomism, but in a mode that allows for and encourages direct engagement with the above theological and exegetical resources, with the aim of bringing together dogmatic, metaphysical, and exegetical modes into a contemporary theology that is Thomistic, ecumenical, and grounded in scripture and in fathers. With regards to the future direction in which biblical Thomism may develop, it's possible to identify three main areas uh, that show promise. First, reconstruction of commentaries which were not written by Thomas on the basis of quotation, which can be found in his systematic works or other commentaries. This method can be used to interpret, for example, the Song of Songs, as Father Bonino uh, did, a similar approach can also be used for sapiential books or the book of Genesis, for instance. Second, observation of how biblical quotation function in the different systematic works or in the commentaries of Dionysius, Boetius, and Aristotle, thus explaining in more detail the normative character of scripture for theological studies. And thirdly, increased interest in the history of biblical commentaries in the Thomistic school and in the reception and continuation of Aquinas' method. In this context, publication, uh, for instance, of Cayetan's biblical commentaries some years ago is a very promising sign. In response to the question posed in the title, that is, text, method, or goal, one must answer, as Aquinas would, et, et, one and other, rather than out, out, either one or the other. Biblical Thomists suggest paying attention not only to the text of biblical commentaries and to the theological method, but also to the purpose of the reflection being undertaken, a reflection which draws light from, for a Christian existence from the truth about God. The goal is not to fortify and enclose theology in its language, but to remind us that Exegesis is an encounter with the living God, and thus to open it to the new terms so that Aquinas' key can be used to unlock further challenges that face the wisdom coming from above, from the Father of Lights. Thank you for your attention.